Is this the one? I have the AAA one here sitting underneath its bigger brother, the 789, which I previously reviewed. So you can check that out on my channel. I'll chuck a little thing up in the corner so you can uh, link to that, see that if you are curious later on. And also the Cavalli tube hybrid, which I've also reviewed previously. I've actually got a nicer tube in it than the stock tube that it comes with. But well, let's talk about that a little bit later. Also the Asgard 3, which I likewise reviewed recently. So you can check all those reviews out too if you want to get a different impression of how I think each amp performs. But all the same, Drop sent me this uh, AAA one. And if you're not familiar with these, Drop, I believe, was the first company to commercially produce an amp using the THX AAA technology. So it's a much like its older brother. It's, well, a AAA-based amp, and it has uh, a single input. But in this case, single-ended output rather than the balanced circuit that's in the 789. It has the three gain stages, which is very handy as they more or less cover you know, in-ear monitors on the lowest, full-sized headphones and insensitive full-sized headphones on the right, and basic volume control. But this time you have a preamp output which can be switched in or out, which is very handy if you're a person, say, if you have active speakers or you want to use it as a inexpensive preamp with a power amp to power full-size speakers, which is what I did. Probably that's worth going over the differences between, say, not only the 789 and the AAA-1, but also what is a AAA circuit in basic terms. So in this, we saw with the AAA 789 that the it has balanced and single-ended inputs, yet actually internally it has to be con the balanced input has to be converted back to single-ended for the AAA circuit to work. Then it go go gets output as a differential or balanced output, which you can use through the 4-pin XLR socket. But it also has a reasonably powerful single-ended outputs and, of course, a 35 millimeter socket for in-ear monitors and the like, whereas the AAA one, you only have one socket, and if you want to use a 3.5 millimeter plug, then you just have to you get an adapter. So in that, they still are pretty reasonably powerful amps. So what is this AAA technology? Well, just to take a quick overview, roughly, of how amplifiers work. So an amplifier essentially takes a signal and some power and then uses the power to make a louder signal. And it does this with a series of transistors, including if it's an op amp, which is a chip basically with an entire amplification circuit built into it. And then it uses some combination of those and, and uh, a power supply set up to produce a larger signal. Now, the thing is, all components inside any, well, electronic device will produce some kind of distortion. So the idea of various designs, including the AAA line, is to reduce that distortion as much as possible. One of the methods they use commonly in amps is called negative feedback, which is exactly as it sounds. You get a the output and you put a line back to the input and they kind of use the difference to cancel out some of the noise. Now in regular amps you might have uh, local feedback through part of the amplification circuit as there might be multiple gain stages in there or you might have global feedback which is from the output to the input to kind of correct for some of the distortion and how much and whether you use it at all even is very much up to the engineer and there are different ideas about whether it's good bad or, or it's good and bad points which are too kind of complex to get into in this the idea with the AAA amps is that an inverse of the distortion from the negative feedback circuit is, is amplified and fed to the final output and that removes the distortion in an active way. It's kind of rather like the electronic equivalent of noise cancelling headphones, except the distortion being cancelled out is from the circuit itself rather than outside noise. So in that, it's a very clever technology. And if you do measure them, they do measure incredibly well with incredibly low noise. The only problem is these measurements are not music. It's kind of like putting a car on a dyno and going for the, you know, the best kind of power up curve. A dyno is not the same as you know, driving on a track or the street. And so that's where the kind of limitations are. Now, measurements, as I've always said, are for manufacturers to check whether things are working properly or not. And to in, you know, ensure that, say, you, know, you get a spike down the 50, kilo, 50 hertz region or 60 hertz region, you know you've got, oh, well, there's maybe some power supply noise creeping in there. Maybe you need to fix something. Or you know, check that there are, there are no major issues with a design or whether, basically whether the design is working properly. They're not really for people like you or me to make value judgments about whether something is good or bad. The other thing is measurement graphs. If The decibel scale is not a linear scale. So if you see, say, for example, someone has a distortion spike at minus 80 dB from full signal, 
that's actually a really, really tiny signal. Every six decibels up is doubling the sound. Every six decibels down is halving the sound. So say 20 decibels down from a signal, you're already at one tenth of the sound. So if you think about you know, how far, you know, you're getting down into hundreds or, you know, tiny minute fractions of sound when you look at these graphs. They just look worse than they really are because the scale being used is logarithmic, equivalent to logarithmic rather than being linear. So, and they, so they, I tend to find measurements tend to be really overhyped. And to illustrate the case in point, Shoot Audio did blind listening where they couldn't, where Jason Soddard said he couldn't even tell the difference between uh, one of his best measuring amps and one with a tube amp which measured 100 times worse, he actually couldn't tell the difference between them. 100 times worse! So think about it. Most of the kind of distortion that people rant about online isn't really something that's noticeable. As long as the amp is working properly, if you enjoy listening with it, it's fine. But then back on, let's get on to what's going on here. The main question is, do these low distortion numbers translate into good listening? Now, if you've seen my AAA 789 review, you probably can guess what's going to be pretty similar. I level matched them and I could not tell the difference between them. I couldn't tell anything apart. And well, you know, I, while I couldn't blind AB them, I'm happy to admit that I doubt that I would ever pass a blind test between them. Now, some things to note here is I was listening, even though I was listening with high-end headphones, I was also listening at a moderate listening level. Now, one of the things we found out with, listen, with uh, say, the small amps, such as, say, things like the Valley 2 and uh, other small amps, the difference between those and the bigger amps is that when you turn the volume up loud or you're using very demanding headphones, and I have Hi-Fi Man Sasfaras here, which are very, very like speaker-like demanding headphones, that's when you notice when amps can actually keep up with the sound. Now, I don't listen loud, so it happens less often with me, but if I do put a pair of demanding headphones on there, you find that these cheap little amps tend to collapse faster. And part of that is the circuit design, as we saw that should work their way around that kind of issue with the circuit design of the Asgard 3, the Lear 3, and the Jotunheim. And the other thing is the power supply. The reason these amps are larger very often, and this amp is mostly an empty case, is because they have a big transformers with a big power supply. If you think of it like if I am going to be do a terrible thing and use a car analogy, imagine you design a car with excellent perform excellent kind of handling and that we can call like our low distortion really excellent handling when the when the wheel turns it turns really sharply exactly you know goes around corners beautifully but then you put a low powered engine in it well then between corners that's where you're going to notice things start to fall apart so in that generally the performance of these amps in general listening when you do turn the volume up with with headphones, even high-end headphones, is very good. They have sufficient power. They have a very well-designed circuit from THX with a very open, clean, clear sound. This very kind of squeaky clean, beautiful, uh, really sharp and precise sound. No harshness, nothing bad to speak of because as much of the distortion as possible has been removed. Likewise, I plugged this into my main system consisting of an Audio GD Master 10 amp, which has a special low distortion circuit, albeit one that doesn't use negative feedback and through my speaker system, much the same kind of thing. Actually, as a preamp, it actually did really well, especially for the $200 they're asking. Very clean, very clear, and you know, very. it brought through the character of what I plugged into it, whether it be a shit audio Yggdrasil, which I use primarily for testing, or even just a little basic Modi 3 Plus, which was the, the latest DAC from shit audio, which I tested recently. But you could hear very clearly the difference between, say, a basic little DAC and a big expensive one, and how the different designs kind of end up sounding with different instruments and music. Very clean, very clear. The thing that showed up, and likewise with other THX amps I've reviewed, is kind of the basic power supply. The sense of kind of depth to the music tended to be kind of lacking. It tended to be all kind of, not quite a wall of music, not quite that bad, but more like everything was clean, clear, and precise, but there was no kind of depth. And I... In comparison, say, the Asgard 3. The Asgard 3 has a warmer sound signature, and it would kind of be a diversion to go into why amps are designed with a different kind of different sound signatures and why what actually the warmth is caused by. But suffice to say, even though it does sound warmer, you do have more of a sense of kind of depth to the music, like the music had slightly more nuance to it. Uh, you could hear them, the, the more micro, micro data tended to come through a little bit better in how it came through rather than saying, you know, it may be a amp that doesn't measure as well on distortion, but the distortion that's being measured isn't something that's really going to affect music anyway. 
it was really in the listening you could tell level matched whether you know what you were actually hearing had a sense of space and depth versus the kind of flatter sound that comes from these AAA amps. Now I thought that the performance from the AAA1 and 789 were a little bit better than the SMSL amps I reviewed, both of which were AAA amps. Those sounded even flatter in how they presented stuff, even though they did have that same clean and clear sound. The nice thing about the AAA1 is you don't have the confusion, of course, of the single-ended balance, single-ended you know, the, the switching backwards and forwards between circuits in there. An interesting thing to note is the one of the most low distortion products I have here, they called Hugo 2. You can listen with that directly with headphones. Now, if I plug that into, say, a AAA1 or the 789 and then listened again, I did lose a little bit of detail. So even though they say, even though they measure with ultra low distortion, you are still going to lose a little bit of detail passing through a set of cables of some kind and the amplifier. That's a really good example of where measurements don't show the loss you actually get from passing signals through components to begin with. One of the nice things about the AAA amps is they're fantastic with in-ear monitors and the AAA one with no exception. Because you have these variable gain stages, you can switch it right down to low gain. You can actually hear very cleanly and very clearly, even with very sensitive in-ear monitors such as Campfire Audio's Andromeda's. But in comparison, say, for example, Cavalli's Tube Hybrid, this doesn't have gain levels. It actually has a fairly high gain, and where it was sitting here at about 11.30 on the dial was actually fairly loud for me when I was listening with full-sized headphones, actually a pair of uh, Final D8000 Pros, if you were curious. Now, with this, it was more musical, and I use that, you know, with the, the usual double quotes, and entertaining to listen with, whereas this, the AAA one, was kind of flat, clean, clear-sounding, for entertainment value, I preferred listening with this tube upgraded, albeit Cavalli Tube Hybrid. However, things like in-ear monitors, while it has a much higher noise floor, and sometimes, you know, turning the volume knob, I heard a little bit of crackling. There seems to be a little DC in the output. It measures much, much worse than the, uh, the AAA amps, of course. That's in there. But in terms of kind of listening enjoyment, I'm probably more likely to plug this into my system than I would the AAA one, simply because I like that more kind of entertaining sound with the bass sounding like it's more filled out, whereas the AAA amps kind of sound weaker in the bass. It felt like, especially with more neutral sounding headphones like the Final D8000s, as kind of more entertaining depending on the kind of music I was listening to. And it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Some people really like that super clean, clear sound and really enjoy it. And some people, like someone I was just talking to today, he said he sold his 789 because he found it too dry and too boring. And I really noticed that, for example, plugging it into a, a Modi 3 Plus, you know, the very latest one, you, that kind of very slightly hard edged, slightly less musical sound from the cheaper, AKM DAC chips was very apparent through the AAA1. I think if you're someone who's just starting out and you went out and bought a AAA1 and it's something like a, one of the new basic DACs from, say, Shit Audio, and you paired it up, you probably find it fantastic. But someone like me who has high-end systems, I can kind of hear the limitations and I can hear that uh, cymbals sound a little bit unnatural and maybe violins and, and that kind of thing don't sound as good. Whereas modern music, you're probably not going to notice that so much as it has a, you know, a lot of maybe electronica and stuff like that. You probably wouldn't care. So if you are someone attracted to that super accurate kind of sound this is you want just something that's super pure in the way it pre in the way it presents music but you're not going to spend you know large amounts of money like you i did we got for the master nine then you actually may find the triple a one to be very good if the idea of kind of enjoying the music is more important than worrying about kind of measurement numbers i'd go for something like this but if you do want something that had, can do it as an all-rounder and act as a preamp actually for 200 bucks it did really well as a preamp with exactly the same kind of sound signature as with headphones that it had no trouble driving. So I hope that was helpful and before you go don't forget that you can sign up become a supporter. These videos are primarily supported by people such as yourself. If you'd like my buying advice, you'd like to hear my impressions of new gear as it comes in, influence what I review and join in our little community it can actually help you out a lot in building your own headphone system as the advice you could get could actually save you a lot of money in the long run. So do consider becoming a supporter. The link is in the description below or also on screen. And thanks everyone who has been supporting me and I'll see you all online.